Ruby Gloom is an immediate cult classic of a nice, friendly, macabre-themed show. Either you love this show as a fun little show for Halloween, or you love this show for how it normalizes enjoying darker-toned aspects of life. In Ruby Gloom, being sad, macabre, or altogether dark is the norm. You follow Ruby as she lives in her house full of colorful characters all doing their own goofy shenanigans. It's what you would get if you mixed Casper the Friendly Ghost with the Addams Family. What are the chances? It's genetic. The electrical current is drawn to the high lead content in our blood and then BOOM! People use you to charge their batteries. This is Misery, possibly my favorite character of the show. Why is she carrying that big box? Ruby's moving now! I don't believe that. Well, I'd move out if I was my roommate. Ruby Gloom began as an original design created by, and I'm gonna not sure how to pronounce the last name, Martin Hsu? This guy worked for Nickelodeon, Facebook, Google, Walt Disney Pictures, and Amazon. Martin created Ruby Gloom primarily for merchandise, like sketchbooks, notepads, and pencil cases, but eventually he started growing on to t-shirts and clothing. Martin and the clothing company that he worked with, Mighty Fine, licensed the show to Nelvana so that they could develop this TV show. Ruby Gloom is a Canadian animated series. You've no doubt heard of Nelvana, or at least know that you've seen their logo because it's the same production company behind Sixteen and Total Drama Island. Heck, the skeleton partner guy in this show, Skullboy, great name by the way, shares the same voice actor who did Owen from Total Drama Island. Roger that tower, we're preparing for takeoff. Several of the characters were established in two full-color children's books that were released prior to the release of the show, Key to Happiness and A Guide to Friendship, where you can see Skullboy, Iris, and Poe. Behold, not only do I have Ruby Gloom's Guide to Friendship, I also have the key to happiness. I'm gonna be going through this and giving you some preliminary concepts that they were working on and workshopping on before the finalized designs in the show. And I'm going to be giving these away on my Instagram. All you gotta do is follow the link in the description, follow me, find this post, and leave a comment. First one that was released was this black book, The Key to Happiness. There's not a lot to glean from the first book, but the more interesting part is that we get to see Misery's first concept artwork and her design really just hasn't changed that much from what they first did. Now here's something I thought was interesting. You have a page that says finders, keepers, losers, weepers does not mean weepers are losers and she in Ruby is holding a skeleton. First I thought that maybe Skullboy, but later on in this book we see what is clearly supposed to be Skullboy. And the reason I bring this up is because I don't think previously that first page was Skullboy because in the second book, A Guide to Friendship, we see a lot more comes out of this book. There is a page where we see Skullboy taking off the skull to reveal what is supposed to be like the super incredibly handsome face that Ruby falls in love with. And so we can, we aren't sure if Skullboy is just a guy, a boy with a skull, or if he is actually a skeleton. This is actually the second book that introduces Iris, the one-eyed Cyclops person. What's also really cool is that at the beginning page spread, there is actually a sh uh, what looks to be a cave that goes into Gloomsville. And so I get into a bit of theory crafting later on in this video about like, where is Gloomsville? Does it exist? Is it in our world? Is it a separate world in its own? And this at least shows that like, it is definitely a hidden location based on the concept artwork. Another thing we get to see is that the conjoined twins character, Frank and Len, which I only now figured out is supposed to be a joke of Franklin. How did I not never see this? I'm literally standing here, watched every episode, the script is being read and video recorded and I'm only now realizing it's Franklin. But the first concept artwork, they really changed. They really changed him. I think I forget if it's Frank or Len. I think it's Len, the green-skinned guy. They completely changed how he looked from his from his initial concept art, which I think it works better because I know they're supposed to be conjoined twins and they're supposed to be looking exactly the same. And their concept was, oh, they have different hairstyles, but also twins doesn't necessarily mean that they have to look the same. So I mean, I guess in this case it would be because they're conjoined, but. I don't know, whatever, who cares? There is also just artwork of just things that Ruby will do with other people, like this character 
washing her hair, that of which we don't know who it is and we will never find out because I don't think she ever appears in the show. I couldn't find her and really, there's a, there's a few characters in these and like some gob monsters and goblins that uh, never make an appearance in the show and they're exclusive only to the books. Saying all bats have to fly is like saying all girls have to wear pink. And we all know that's not true. The show has your typical lesson of the day setup where the major conflict will be resolved by everyone learning how to be a better person, but it's the way that it does it that was appealing to me and everyone else who watched it because it focuses on a cast of characters that stray so far from the norm, their interpretation of these lessons aren't what we would typically think about. And so it ends up being a show where the lessons are actually ahead of their time by trying to recontextualize the lessons from the perspective of these macabre characters, it, for it forces the writers to think of these lessons more objectively. This is a tough gig! I can't even go through walls yet! You gotta scare someone, see? <laughs> All you need to do is haunt Ryan Bergara and you're basically guaranteed to go through walls. Scariest building I've ever been in in my entire life! I discovered Ruby Gloom a long while ago when there was a drought of new Halloween-themed shows. I had already watched Growing Up Creepy and Edgar and Ellen, which were really good shows in themselves, and I can only watch Scary Godmother and Halloween Town so many times before I get a little fatigued. Ruby Gloom always felt different to me because it didn't feel like it was trying to be creepy like the other shows. It was the nice version of Halloween. The kind of vibe you get when you go to your grandma's house and she wants to connect with her grandchildren and find something to do together. But she can't stomach those strange new shows they make nowadays. Ruby Gloom is a great show that's appropriate for everyone. If everyone is disagreeing on what to watch, this show is always the common ground. Ruby Gloom, in terms of actual merch, is pretty lacking. Surprisingly, Hot Topic still offers some Ruby Gloom shirts and hoodies. The plushes are a little more difficult to find and you have to resort to only websites like eBay to get them. And there's this figure designed by Nathan Cabrera. This is one of the more strange ones since it deviates from the original designs but it is unique and interesting, and I would love this in my collection. The entire show takes place in this one house and the immediate surrounding area, and it's all obviously just a bunch of kids that are all hanging out playing games with each other, which you can argue that it's just the limitations of it being a show for little kids, but as fans got older and started, they started developing theories about why they're all in this situation, and they all usually involve each of these characters dying in a way particular to their personality, like, I don't know, Skullboy dying in a house fire when cooking, or Iris losing her eye during her, uh, her death, which is why she only has one eye in this limbo afterlife. Misery died because she's Misery. And Ruby is apparently supposed to be human, at least according to fans online. And well, then again, Hello Kitty is supposed to be a little girl. So I guess Ruby being human isn't strange anymore. Some people say that she died from sickness because she's pale and adopted traits of her favorite red doll toy, or that Ruby actually lost all her friends and created this make-believe world in order to keep being with them. Typically, whenever I hear about online theories, they're always about people dying tragically, at least with Ruby Gloom and their situation is never actually explained. The theories actually Actually make a little bit of sense. I would have argued that this is just the world they live in and this is just how they are, but that's not really a solid argument since we never get to see a world they live in. The house and the yard around it is the world. It's so isolated. No one comes to deliver them anything. No one goes out to get anything. They just have an eternal fully stocked- Wait a minute. I've never noticed that glass house before. There's a moving van parked outside. Oh. Well, I guess this is just the world they live in, and the theories is just edgy kids being edgy on the internet. Yeah, they actually get a neighbor pretty early on, which I guess if I were talking to edgy kids online, they'd argue that it's just another person that's died horribly and tragically that Ruby also knew somehow. So uh, who can tell? But yeah, I kinda, I, I lied to you guys. No, I completely lied. Scaredy Bat, I think is the only character that genuinely annoys me. He's just scared of everything. And that's the whole joke. I get it's supposed to be funny how a bat that's scared of everything is living with a ghost that wants to scare everyone, but that's funny for one episode. Beyond that, the trope of Scaredy Bat being afraid of everything just drags the show down, and there's multiple episodes where they try to get him to really conquer his fears, and I think there's only one episode where they actually do it well, besides the first one where he's like a drummer and Scaredy Bat joins Frank and Len's band and has just like, 
trouble performing in front of people. That one is more relevant. Everything else is just, ah, I'm scared all the time because that's my whole character. The writers rely on him for simple, quick gags that aren't actually funny. Also, side note, why do they make the scared characters Indian for some reason? I mean, Scaredy Bat has an Indian accent and also Baljeet from Phineas and Ferb is scared and the mongoose from um, Littlest Pet Shop. You guys remember that? Why is this a trend? I can't think of too many stereotypes for Indian people, but I can guarantee you one of them is not that they're scared of everything. Yeah, no, it's clearly obvious that they just live in a world of creatures. In season one, they go out into the world and do things outside of the house. I like the theories online that I read, but a lot, and by that I mean almost all of them, rely on the, they died horribly. You see that, you see that with every show, because it's easy and people think it's interesting when really it's not. Quit weighing us down and move towards the light. But I don't want to move towards the light, Frank. I'm not ready to go yet. Okay, okay. I'm gonna start making my own theories around this show. Prepare for my own film theory, but with, you know, actually using evidence from the show. First evidence, Len saying this specifically sounds like they aren't dead. In this episode, Frank and Len are trying to get into their friends' heads in order to make a song about them, and I would argue that they're just passing out and that helps them think somehow, but they both have a shared experience. And since conjoined twins only share a body and not a brain, it leads me to believe that random magical nonsense can happen in this world. Or Frank and Len have strange magic powers. Hard to tell. I'm leaning toward magic stuff just happens for funsies. This is also the episode where they find out Ruby has a crush on Skullboy and she keeps it secret from everyone constantly. But then again, when they asked her about her crust, she was confused. So there's a chance they also just share a brain. Yeah, I'm not sure. What I always thought was weird was that Boo Boo is sort of like a, in a ghost mafia, I guess. They tell him he's gotta scare people or they get upset and they never explain why or even what they get for scaring people. It's just this nebulous detail that they added as a motivator for Boo Boo, but it's not at all fleshed out. I always thought that before and after every episode, they have a small skit where it shows the characters playing or goofing around. So it's like getting three episodes in one every time. So we know they all live in a place called Gloomsville, but they also live in our world canonically. Skullboy and Poe use a time machine to go back to the Titanic and to see Edgar Allan Poe's writing room. So we know this isn't the afterlife. Gloomsville is just a place that is supposedly hidden from the world. Also, they make Edgar Allan Poe's room way nicer than it should be. He was struggling with money most of his life. So while watching the show, I was adamantly looking for evidence that Skullboy was actually a skeleton. Because as I mentioned earlier in the original school, in the original books, Skullboy was a guy wearing a skull. Thankfully, I can rest this case. In the same episode, we see Skullboy completely fall apart, proving that he is a skeleton. Probably not something that was annoying to you guys as it was me, but I feel a massive itch was scratched in my brain. There's an episode where Misery leaves the house to go on a trip. And when she leaves, the clouds part and they see the sun for the first time in who knows how long. And it's literally because Misery brings the storm clouds. If I were to make any theory on this show, it's that Misery is some sort of, I don't know, deity of Gloomsville, where the sun is abnormally powerful and Misery is there to protect the inhabitants of Gloomsville from the sun, that and the fact that the entire existence attracts sadness and misery. It, the whole place is named Gloomsville. That sounds like a synonym for Misery. It sounds like they named the whole place after Misery, but just changed, changed it a little bit to be a little more unique. It's not a talent scout. Come on, Frank. Let's drown our sorrows in a tub of peanut butter. Oh, thank goodness I'm not the only one who does this. Now, you might be wondering if maybe all of them are some sort of deity in their own way, and I'd argue otherwise, given that we have an episode where Skullboy decides to leave in order to go on a journey of self-discovery. And after he left, nothing happened. Unlike with Misery, where the massive weather storms follow her, everyone is just sad that Skullboy left. There was absolutely no repercussions. The only thing this did was establish Ruby's feelings for Skullboy. Now there just is not a lot of stuff to work with, seeing as it's just a nice, you know, episodic where there is no overarching story. You just watch an episode, it's self-contained and it's nice. 
And so I think with what little evidence I have, I like this tiny little theory I've made of Ruby Gloom. I also did not expect to be theory crafting when I jumped into making this video, but honestly, I'm marginally proud of myself. If anyone else has theories about this show, please tell me in the comments below or theories about any other show that of which you watch and you have a neat take with. Ruby Gloom ended after a 40 episode run. It was just a fun show that was made to help sell product, but it ended up being a small iconic Halloween series, if you ask me. A show that I like to revisit every once in a while and show to people who like things like Lenore or Emily. If you haven't watched Ruby Gloom and need a new show to put on the background during this season, I can't recommend this show enough. Ruby Gloom is a show for people who can't handle scary movies and may never fully transition to the darker aspects of Halloween and instead just want more comforting shows that remind them of Disney Channel Halloween specials, even though this didn't air on Disney Channel. You know what I mean? It's that kind of show that will embrace the surface aspects of Halloween and create a story that everyone can get behind. Just a colorful cast of characters that fit the aesthetic and is not hard to love. Don't forget I'm doing a giveaway for these two books on my Instagram. If you want, I can sign them too, I guess. I'll, I'll message you if that's a thing you want to do. Mishi snuck into the office. Mishi. Say hi. No comment. Come on, give us a meow. Give us a meow. I made him angry. He has to go through physical therapy and I'm the one that's really driving it home for him and also giving him baths. So he's like, ugh, I don't like you anymore. Anyway, I hope you enjoyed this video. Stay beautiful and keep playing.